Hello everyone and welcome to our second video in the Flexible Budgets and Standard Costing series. And in this video we'll be specifically speaking to direct labor variances, how to calculate them, as well as journalize them. If you missed the first video where we calculated direct material variances, you will likely want to go back and watch that video because in that video I describe each piece of the diagram that I'm about to draw for you. In this video, I won't be as specific because I'm assuming that you've already watched that video. So if you haven't, please go back and watch that video. It will make this a little bit easier for you when you watch this video. Okay, so here is the diagram that we talked about in the prior video when we looked at direct material variances. The chart is exactly the same. The pegs, the three pegs in the primary diagram are labeled the same, actual quantity times actual price for peg one. Peg two is actual quantity times standard price and peg three is standard quantity times standard price. Now remember in the first video, we described and defined each one of those items. So again, if you haven't watched that video, please go back and watch it. I think it'll really help. Now the variances are named a little something different with labor variances. The first variance is called a rate variance. Now, depending on the textbook you have, the textbook may call this a price variance, very similar to material variances. But in my head, I pay a price for materials. I don't pay my labor a price. I pay my labor a rate. So I call this a rate variance. But the calculations are still the same, no matter what you define it as. The second variance is called an efficiency variance. And the total overall variance is still called a flexible budget variance. And they're calculated the same way. The difference in pegs 1 and 2 is the rate variance. The difference in pegs 2 and 3 is the efficiency variance. And the flexible budget, once again, can be um, calculated two ways. The summation of the two variances or the difference in peg one and peg three. And again, we're gonna use an example to calculate these numbers to make it a little bit more clear. So we're gonna use the exact same example that we did for material variances in the prior video. So if you have those notes, please get that out. We're gonna compare these two here in just a little bit. So Salisbury Inc. is a privately held furniture manufacturer. For August, Salisbury had the following standards for one of its products, a wicker chair, Direct materials were two square yards of input at $5 per square yard. Direct labor is a half hour of input at $10 per hour. The following data were compiled regarding actual performance. Actual output units, which are chairs produced, was 2000 Square yards of input purchased and used was 3700 Price per square yard was $5.10. Direct labor costs were $8,820. Actual hours of input were 900 and labor price per hour was $9.80. So what we're tasked with here is to compute the rate, efficiency, and flexible budget variances for labor. So the first thing we do is draw our chart and label everything. So do that now. All right, so here I've drawn my diagram and I've labeled everything. Make sure you do this each time because it does make it a little more simple when you have it already laid out here for you and all you have to do is fill in the blanks. So let's start with peg number one. So we're looking for actual quantity. Now we're talking about labor variances. So we're looking specifically for labor. So what is the actual quantity of labor? Well, if you notice in the first uh, paragraph up here, if we call it that, that's where they give us the standards. And in the second paragraph is where they give us the actual stuff because that's important that we can separate those two things. So we're looking for actual information. So we're going to look at the second paragraph here. So the actual hours of input were 900. So actual labor was 900 hours. And what was the actual price? Now we're talking about hours, so I need a per hour price. And they give me that. Labor price per hour is $9.80. So we multiply those together, we get an actual cost of $8,820. But in this particular problem, they actually gave, it, gave this to me already. But I wanted you to see that we can actually calculate it with the information that they gave us. All right, so let's look at peg two. We already have actual quantity, so we're just going to bring that on over. And now I need a standard price, the price that I should have paid per hour of labor. 
And so the standards are in the top section here, and it tells us that we paid, or the standard was $10 per hour. Okay, so I'm going to put that there. And I'm going to multiply these through, and I get an actual quantity times standard price of $9,000. Well, let's move on to the third peg before we do any variances. We're looking for standard quantity times standard price. Well, I already found standard price to be $10 per hour, so I'm just going to bring that on over. Now I need to calculate standard quantity. Remember in the first video, the definition I gave you for standard quantity, and this works for all standard quantities, not just materials, not just labor, but all of them. Standard quantity is what should have happened at the actual level of production. So the actual level of production, they tell me, is 2,000 chairs. That's my actual level of production. I'm producing chairs. Now, what should have happened? We're talking about labor here. So how much labor should have been used per chair? They tell us in the story that the standards, which is what should have happened, is in the first paragraph. We should have had a half an hour of input per chair. So one half of an hour. So the standard quantity is therefore a thousand hours. So a thousand times ten dollars is ten thousand dollars. Now we can calculate our variances. So the difference in pegs one and two, we're just looking at numbers right now, is a hundred and eighty dollars is my rate variance. The difference in pegs two and three is a thousand dollars. Now remember variances always have a sign. They are never negative, but they have a sign. They're either unfavorable or favorable. So to get the first variance, the rate variance, like we did in the prior video, let's only think about what is different amongst these first two equations. Forget all the numbers. The only difference is price. The quantity is the same in these two equations, but the price is different. So let's focus on the price. So we actually paid $9.80 but we should have only paid, we should have paid $10 per hour. So we actually paid 20 cent less than we thought we'd have to pay per hour. That's a good thing. So that makes this variance favorable. Let's compare the last two pegs. The only difference in these two pegs is quantity in these equations. So let's focus on just those numbers. So the actual quantity of hours was 900 but the standard quantity of hours was 1,000. So we thought that we would use 1,000 hours at our level of production, but we really only used 900 hours. So we used less hours. That's a good thing. So that's favorable as well. Now, before we start interpreting our variances, let's get the flexible budget variance. So again, there's two ways we can get this variance. We can get it by combining the two variances, or summing them, and because they're the same sign, they're both favorable, we can add them together. So our overall flexible budget variance would be 1,180, and we bring the sign down. The other way to calculate this number, like we did in with materials, is to take the difference in peg 1 and peg 3. So our actual cost for labor was $8,820, and the cost we thought we'd have to pay, or our budgeted cost, was $10,000 for labor. So we actually incurred less labor than we thought, therefore it's a favorable variance, because our actual cost is less than what we budgeted it to be. Now let's interpret these variances. Now let's think back to what we did with materials with this same problem in the prior video. So... If my memory serves me correctly, we had an unfavorable price variance for materials, meaning we paid a little bit more for our materials than we thought, but we had a favorable, quite a large favorable quantity variance, meaning we thought we probably purchased a good quality material. But then we said we have to look at labor to make sure our labor, is, what the story is going on with labor. So let's look at labor. So we have a favorable rate variance. That means we, we paid a little bit less for our labor than we thought, that could mean a couple of things. That could mean that maybe we've got unskilled labor. Well, if we look at the efficiency variance, it's favorable as well. So our labor is actually very efficient. So we probably don't have unskilled labor. We probably actually have some skilled labor here, 
and we have a good quality material, making them even more efficient because of the good quality material. So that's what we've got going on. We've paid a little bit more for a good quality material, and we actually paid a little bit less for our labor, but we still have good skilled labor. So it could mean that it's, that it's not a great economy right now, so we're able to get labor at a pretty good, pretty good price. The last thing we want to talk about is the journal entry for labor. Now, I'm going to demonstrate only one journal entry for labor, so it's going to be the incurrence and use of labor in one journal entry, but your textbook may show where there's two journal entries for labor. If, if your textbook shows two journal entries for labor, then follow the format that we did for materials. It's very similar to that, but if your textbook uses one journal entry for labor, then this is the way you would do that. Okay, so we're going to end up journalizing these numbers here, okay? So peg one and three and the two variances. So just like we talked about with materials, the standard always goes directly into process. So that's a given. And think about what do you your workers want you to pay them? Well, they want you to pay them what you actually owe them. So that would be your credit to wages payable. And the other piece is to journalize the variances. Remember that unfavorable variances are always debits because they increase cost of goods sold, and favorable variances are always credits because they decrease cost of goods sold. In this case, we have two favorable variances, so they're both credits, and that should make our journal entry balance, and it does. Don't forget to give my video a thumbs up if you found it helpful. Also, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and therefore you would get um, announcements of when new videos have been uploaded. Also, please visit my website at theaccountingdoctor.com, where you'll find other interesting accounting information, games, lecture notes, and even more videos.